The Communications Committee of the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce, in cooperation with KROC Television, presents Comment, a weekly public affairs program. Collective bargaining for farmers is the subject of this afternoon's show. Each of the four major farm organizations is represented on today's panel. Representing the Grange is C.J. Davis, field assistant to the master of the National Grange. On behalf of the Minnesota Farmers Union is Cy Carpenter, executive secretary for the Minnesota Farmers Union. The Farm Bureau spokesman is Walter Priggy, past president of the Olmsted County Farm Bureau. And speaking for the NFO is Erhard Fingston, vice president of the National Farmers Organization. Our moderator is Mr. Wendell Maltby, executive vice president of the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Maltby. Collective bargaining for farmers has become a controversial subject in recent years. In the news have been things such as the dumping of milk, uh, the killing of hogs. Uh, we've seen violence. We've seen uh, family pitted against family in some instances. And so this afternoon, we think this subject of collective bargaining for farmers is one that should be of interest to our viewers and of uh, interest to all of us here on the panel. I'd like to open the panel by addressing the same question to each of our four panelists, and that is, in general, what's the view of your organization on collective bargaining for farmers? What are your goals and objectives, and uh, what do you see are going to be the results of the efforts that are underway now toward collective bargaining? And I think we'll start with Mr. Davis. Well, Mr. Maltby, uh, the National Grange uh, feels that it is quite necessary for uh, farmers generally to understand that uh, uh, they must have bargaining power in, in this present day and age and under existing economic circumstances. The problem, of course, is how do you get uh, uh, collective bargaining power in the face of, uh, of overproduction, you might say. So we feel that uh, it uh, will involve uh, not uh, a single barrel approach, but uh, a multiple approach to the situation. We'll have to work on a commodity by commodity basis, with each commodity working out uh, its own uh, bargaining program in accordance with the amount that is on hand, the potential uh, production, and this sort of thing. Of course, we're very uh, much in favor of present cooperatives and the work that they're doing. We think that this should be expanded <clears throat> to the extent that it is possible to do so. And uh, uh, we feel that it's very important. We are very frank to confess that, uh, as you have said, um, it is not only controversial, but it is also a very complex problem. This is why it's controversial. Uh, but we feel it with goodwill uh, among all of our organizations and people, and certainly this is not just a problem for farmers alone. We would like um, all of our friends in the cities and the towns to understand that they have a great stake uh, in farm economics, and I'm sure that uh, the very fact that uh, your organization, the Chamber of Commerce, is taking a great hand in trying to bring farmers and city people together so that each of us can understand the other's problems better is an indication that we are moving closer together and that we are have at least recognized the problem and are, are beginning to make some steps toward solving it. Fine. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, <coughs> representing the uh, Minnesota Farmers Union, what are your organization's views on this subject? Well, thank you, Mr. Maltby. Uh, first, I'd like to express uh, our appreciation and uh, and applaud your organization for uh, promoting this type of a public service to provide better understanding, uh, not only of collective bargaining, but of some of the discussion and problems of agriculture. At the offset, I'd like to say that uh, Farmers Union is a family farm organization. The purpose of uh, Farmers Union is to improve the income and the standard of living for family farmers and I say this at the start because uh, whether it's uh, collective bargaining or whatever it might be, we're interested in promoting uh, a measure such as this if it will benefit the income and the standard of living of the family farmer. 
we think it's necessary to recognize that uh, there are numerous problems that, uh, that uh, are related and correlated with collective bargaining. Uh, for example, the uh, tax loss write-off that uh, business uh, abuses agriculture with, the uh, corporate uh, invasion on uh, land ownership, and uh, the provision of uh, uh, providing their own source of supply. And we mentioned these at the uh, start to point out that uh, unless some of these are considered in connection with collective bargaining, that there may be no family farms left to, uh, to uh, carry on or to benefit from. Now, this is not to minimize collective bargaining. Rather, to put it in its proper perspective, we think that it is uh, vitally necessary. It is not new. Uh, it has been considered. As a matter of fact, Farmers Union has worked not only with the idea, but with programs in, in collective bargaining for at least 30 years. And it has its ups and downs in public uh, acceptance and uh, public consideration. It is a vital part, and this needs to be understood by the public, of our free enterprise system. Uh, the uh, other segments of our business and economy have prospered much as a result of a beneficial and successful collective bargaining. The farmer has not, because he has not had this uh, similar position, and as a result, our rural economy has lagged. Our production has... Uh, outstrip industry and business, but our economy has lagged. Now, today the chances perhaps are better. Uh, there's more interest, this rises and falls, there's more interest. The activity you're carrying on uh, here today in, uh, illustrates this. Uh, there's more consideration in, of the need of a rural community by the metropolitan community because uh, some of their problems are compounded by the deterioration of a rural community. And probably the focal point now is the introduction of the Mondale Bill for uh, a specific act dealing with agricultural or collective <coughs> bargaining. We're very pleased that uh, Senator Mondale has introduced this bill because we believe this will, will now bring it in a perspective where it can be considered and some specifics worked out as well as a better understanding. We feel that uh, the public must understand this and that uh, the mechanics of bargaining to be successful must be worked out. In other words, we must have a, a bargaining pattern that's workable and enforceable. And uh, we don't have the time to go into detail, but there are several basics I think we need to uh, mention and the public needs to consider. First, the producer, the family farmer producer, must have a voice. It must be an equal voice if he's going to bargain. The processor must, be, uh, must bargain. There must be some method of forcing him to bargain. There must be a, a means of negotiation so that there can't be a deliberate stalemate or boycott. There must be a method of regulating production, not only of the farmer's production, but uh, outside sources that could be used to uh, weaken the position of the family farmer. And all of these must be enforceable by law. Now, we think the Mondale uh, Act will cause a, a better discussion and understanding of this. It also points out that some commodities will require a different approach to bargaining than others. And uh, one uh, further note on the Mondale Bill that I think is important, it brings into the uh, whole uh, realm of discussion the position of the consumer. This is necessary because his position needs to be considered. It also is necessary from his position as a voter. And quite often in the past, uh, one uh, voice or the other has worked to the disparity or the disadvantage of the farmer by flaunting the consumer and talking about unnecessarily high costs of food or whatever. Uh, the consumer gets food cheaper than he ever did before, but he is susceptible to this kind of propaganda. And if he is a part of a bargaining effort and understands and has a representative there, we think this is helpful and is necessary. We think that <coughs> the Mondale Bill also was helpful in that it brought out some of the opposition. And, in mo and, and, and opposition is expected. And this is mostly from those who benefit most in profit from the low-priced uh, products of agriculture. I think Our, you uh, bring out some interesting points here that uh, maybe we can come back to a little bit. Uh, there are one or two that I'm particularly interested in, uh, in discussing good. with you a little bit more. Mr. Finkston, your National Farmers Organization has uh, probably gained more uh, press coverage in recent years in this uh, collective bargaining situation than have uh, most of the other organizations. And I'm very interested in your views uh, on this subject of collective bargaining for farmers and your organization's views. Well, our organization, of course, started as a protest group during the days when the farmers were depending, and for that matter, still are to a great extent, on the government to get their prices for them. Our political power was declining so fast, we had 30% of the votes on the farm when we started getting farm programs that did give us pretty good, 
crisis. By the time that uh, we had protested a number of years, we had fallen to 12% of the votes out there, and now we're down below 6%. So about 10 years ago, the leaders of the NFO started studying the situation, why the farmers aren't getting a price, and of course started to build a national organization for this sole purpose of getting the farmers a price through their own efforts by pricing their production, selling it on contract at least a year ahead, and then produce for that contract. So I'd say on the national basis, definitely, the NFO was the leader in collective bargaining. At the time when we started the term collective bargaining for agriculture, for that much bargaining power for agriculture had, had not even been heard of. So we're building a national organization for this very purpose. Uh, certainly the co-ops and other local groups have made valiant efforts to get the farmers a price, but since our uh, processors or our buyers, or the the final outlets have become national in scope where they're able to bypass any area, any market, any individual. It got to the point, of course, where uh, such efforts uh, couldn't do any great amount of good anymore. So we decided it had to be a national organization. It had to be an organization dealing in all commodities, bringing them all up in relative balance, because if you took one commodity, didn't do anything for the others, you'd have, first of all, a shifting from one commodity into the other. Price were good in one, bad in the other. And then, of course, it had, as it was also, the tendency to have one group working against the other. You had the livestock man, ag man against the grain farmer, the grain farmer against the livestock man, small farmer against big farmer, <coughs> the east against the Midwest, and the west against all of them. So it's about the way it went. So this is why it has to be an organization dealing in all commodities. So the uh, NFO has now built a national organization. We're in 45 states now. In a very short time, we will cover all of the continental United States for this purpose of bringing farmers together to use the bargaining power that they have. And of course, the only power that they do have is the product itself. So it has to be used as every business and every industry does. The farmers remained an individual in the market while the entire rest of the economy has modernized, organized, consolidated, and merged. So the farmer, in order to get a fair price, is going to have to get bargaining power, and he can do it only through organization, to where he can have the same kind of influence on the market that the national buyers have. And of course, this has to be handled by a national organization. The point of control has been uh, mentioned here. There too, any organization that's going to do this job of collective bargaining is going to have to look after the whole problem. So the program of the NFO is the basic step. First, you've got to get the farmers together. You can't do anything until you've done that. You're, you're whistling in the dark talking about bargaining until you have the organization. Second place, to price our own product on the basis of what it costs to produce and then sell the car on contract at least a year ahead and then enforce your prices with the control of the sale of your production. Supply the market with all that it can use at all times at a full fair price, but no more than that. Then if there's anything left beyond that in, uh, for domestic markets, channel that into world markets or secondary markets. Take the discount if you have to on that. But don't let the last pound that you produce set the price on the very first pound. And this is exactly what has been happening. And failing to be able to move it, then of course isolate it from the market so that it cannot be used to depress all of the prices. So I'd say NFO is definitely the pioneer, the leader in collective bargaining. And when we started out, we had a fight <coughs> about everybody that there is on this. There is real, no real controversy. Uh, if anyone will analyze it, of course, any change that's ever been brought about has been considered controversial. Uh, we're not very far from Lincoln's birthday today, and I think we're probably in the most Christian nation on earth, and there isn't a Christian in this nation that would say that uh, slavery is right. Yet it was controversial at that time, and the nation fought the biggest and the bloodiest war that's ever been fought over that very issue. Uh, with one group trying to maintain that uh, very thing. Today, when we look back of it, it doesn't even make sense that anybody should ever have objected. So I think we're coming into that change now where all groups and, and uh, most people are beginning to realize that if the farmer's going to produce the food that the nation needs, he's going to have to be paid for it. It just won't work.
Well, those are interesting uh, viewpoints and uh, some interesting parallels you draw. Mr. Priggy, the Farm Bureau is one of the uh, older farm organizations, as I recall. Uh, what are your organization's views on this subject? Well, thank you, Mr. Malby. Farm Bureau has been much more active and for a longer time in the farm bargaining field than most people realize. Farm Bureau has worked uh, in marketing for about the past 10 years and for the last seven years has actually been marketing products through its affiliate, the American Agricultural Marketing Associations. We uh, <coughs> have begun primarily in fruits and vegetables because these uh, uh, commodities are produced in a more local area and are not affected with the tremendous problems which uh, arise from, from a commodity which is, is uh, produced on a nationwide basis. And uh, in 1968, the American Agricultural Marketing Association did market <coughs> about one and a half billion dollars worth of agricultural products. The Farm Bureau believes and feels the same as the NFO in the fact that uh, these commodities are going to have to be contracted for in advance of the production season. Farmers have very little power left to, to bargain for a, uh, a price after the, the commodity has been uh, produced. And one of the problems that the farmers have had over the years is the fact that we have a tremendous ability to, to produce and we know very little or nothing about what uh, dictates the market. <coughs> and I believe that if, if farmers are going to, uh, to control the market, they're going to have to know what factors dictate what the market price is and become very well educated in uh, the market itself. Well, good. You know, I uh, hear, I think, what is a, an, sort of an interesting agreement between the four of you here that there needs to be some sort of bargaining. The, the farmer has to have a bargaining power of some sort. Now, uh, Mr. Finkston, I think, said that you need to have a, a national group to do this. And as I am aware of your organizations, you're all national in scope. Uh, is there any reason why the four of you shouldn't get together if, if really a national organization, a, a collective effort of farmers is the thing that you need? Why can't the four of you get together and do this in a really unified front? Well, Mr. Baldy, I'd like to take a crack at that. I believe that we're a little bit like uh, the Catholics and the Protestants, a little bit like the Republicans and the Democrats. We all know where we want to go, but we don't know just exactly uh, which is the right road to get there. And I think there's more involved, really, in it than that. And that is the laws that you have under which collective bargaining can be done. It is the Capra Volstead Act. And the Capra Volstead Act does uh, permit us as producers or farmers in one organization or one group to bargain collective. But the minute that you put the two together, then you're right back under the under antitrust laws because then it comes po becomes collusion uh, between those two groups. And this is the reason why we felt we had to build a new organization. Now, I'm not trying to shortchange any other organization by any means. Uh, other organizations were set up to bring farmers uh, other services. This they did, and they did well. But uh, there are so many things that have to be considered in connection with this that we had to build a new organization to do it. I think the Sunkiss decision by the Supreme Court recently brought this out very clearly, where the Supreme Court took away from the Sunkist organization the exemption granted by virtue of, by, uh, from the antitrust laws by virtue of the Capra Volstead Act. They had 15% non-producers as members in their organization. This is why we don't let anybody into our organization except producers. This is also why we don't get into business. This becomes another conflicting area. So we couldn't see it any other way that it was going to take a new organization and of course an organization for that purpose and that purpose only. And that is the only program of the NFO. While we do support farm legislation and have <coughs> Uh, I think one of the very finest uh, farm lobbyists, uh, by the way, we have Harry Graham now, of the, formerly of the Grange. I respect him very much and our association with the Grange in cooperation, as well as other organizations. But uh, we do watch farm programs. We do everything that we can on that level. And we think it'd be a catastrophe to pull the programs out from under farmers until they are ready to do their own job. So we are uh, working in that field, too, to protect, of course, the oh, fine. Maybe opportunity. We can let Mr. Carpenter, Mr. Davis, do you have any comment on the question of why I would not like get together? To, um, 
just make a comment that um, I think Mr. Priggy and Mr. Fingston, uh, I think we're all in, in agreement, as has already been said, on the basics. But there are many, many things involved. For example, uh, as a nation, we're deeply involved in um, various programs, but chiefly uh, programs, well, I, I perhaps shouldn't say chiefly governmental programs, because there are many charitable institutions, church groups, and so forth that are engaged in trying to help alleviate hunger throughout the, the world. And, and this enters into the problem because, uh, well, I may, I may be getting a little far afield, but the point is that these things all have to be considered. And uh, I doubt that we can sit here in the richest nation in the world um, on uh, uh, a, an already available supply and an almost unlimited production potential while 50% of the world is starving. So this all has to come in. My point being that uh, collective bargaining, our bargaining of any kind, uh, so far as the farmer is concerned, and, and profit to the farmer, an advantage to the farmer, can only be done when the farmer or some entity has control of the supply. And you can bargain from this standpoint. Um, so this uh, appears to me perhaps one of the basic um, disagreements that we might have among us as organizations would be in who and how, uh, who's going to control the, the supply. We won't say production. Maybe we shouldn't use the word control. Maybe manage would be a better word because words are very important. But uh, how's this going to be done and how are we going to keep on hand an abundant supply of food and fiber to, so, to uh, provide for our domestic needs, a uh, legitimate trade uh, and export for dollars, PL 480, uh, uh, Freedom from Hunger Foundation, and all of these various things. It's a, it's a very involved thing. We talk about collective bargaining. We, we have first to control our product. And uh, we believe that this is going to, to take, and I think we would all agree perhaps on that, legislation. To what extent, then we might get into some disagreement. But I did want to open up this whole uh, bag of tricks here, you might say, to, to show that it is a very complex problem. Well, this is uh, interesting. And uh, Mr. Carpenter, unless you have something more to add to this briefly, uh, there's another question I'd like to get into well, in the few minutes Just very briefly, we have left. I'd like to say that uh, there is a lot more common agreement than, uh, than is generally recognized. The uh, division or differences of opinion are played up. But we do feel that there is a, a lot of common ground and that where this common ground exists, uh, four voices sometimes are more effective than one. And if we're talking about a means where we can all work together, perhaps a legislative pattern is the best approach. And as this uh, uh, broadcast is being viewed by the listeners, we will be in Washington with representatives from 38 states or 38 counties in the state on our first fly-in to provide better understanding of the bargaining bill. Good. Mentioning legislation, and I think we only have a, a very brief amount of time to touch this question, but I'd like to get your response. There is, uh, in the Minnesota legislature currently, or there are several bills dealing with corporate farming, uh, putting, uh, imposing either some limits or restrictions of some sort on uh, corporations owning farms. It leads to a question that I hear asked quite <coughs> often, and that being, uh, what is a small farmer? Uh, what is the family farm that we hear defended so much? Uh, how do you define this? Can we do this? A few words? Well, I'll take a crack at it first. Um, uh, first to, to um, and your question about corporate farming. Corporate farming <clears throat> as such, that is, if the farmer, if the family farm, many family farms are incorporated for various reasons. And uh, we, see no, uh, we see no problem here. It's the conglomerate corporations. It's when you begin to get into the area, as Mr. Fingston has already mentioned, uh, uh, you can have one company here, or one financial institution, uh, furnishing the uh, finance and, uh, and actually operating many, uh, the production, distribution of many different uh, products. Well, is, there the, any, is there any definition though, of a family farm that we can agree upon? Yes. Uh, well, I, I don't know whether we would agree, but, uh, <laughs> but I, want, I, I did want to bring out this since you mentioned the corporate farming. It's the conglomerate type of corporation where they, where they do business in, in some other uh, 
uh, in some other business. Then they come in and buy a farm, add it to the total corporate ent entity, and, uh, and this is where the problems come in. But uh, a family farm is one where the, the family uh, uh, operates on its own capital or provides its own financing. Uh, this is the Grange view, uh, where the family is fully employed and uh, the number of other employees might be uh, more or less a matter of question, but then it can be any size for that matter, as long as it's a single operation under a family uh, group. It can be incorporated, but it is, it is doing, it producing a farm product. Well, the rest of you uh, generally agree with this definition since we're <laughs> yeah, pretty much much, uh, so. Very quickly pretty on, the, uh, on the specific uh, bills before the state legislature, they do provide that uh, a corporation, if the majority of the members are bona fide farmers, that is, they live on the farm and receive the majority of their income from the farm, would be exempt from this uh, regulation. But it does heighten the point that I made earlier that uh, this needs consideration. If a corporate uh, interest can come in here and provide their own source, this would uh, very much weaken your position of bargaining. Well, fine. Uh, I think at the beginning of the program, Mr. Davis, you said that this subject of collective bargaining for farmers is a complex subject. And uh, I guess I've become more aware of that in the few minutes that we've had together here today. And unfortunately, uh, we just scratched the surface of this subject. Uh, we're very pleased that last Thursday uh, we were able to have representatives of your organizations on our Agribusiness Day program here in Rochester. And we hope that we will continue to do this in future years. And I want to extend the thanks to the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce to you four gentlemen for being with us on comment today. This has been a presentation of Comment, a weekly public affairs program presented by the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce in cooperation with KROC Television. Today's guests were C.J. Davis, field assistant to the master of the National Grange, Cy Carpenter, executive secretary for the Minnesota Farmers Union, Walter Priggy, past president of the Olmsted County Farm Bureau, and Erhard Fingston, vice president of the National Farmers Organization. Comment will be seen again next Sunday, February 23rd, at this same time. Thank you for being with us. U.S. Farm Report has brought to you Comment with the cooperation of the Rochester Chamber of Commerce, Rochester, Minnesota. This program was made possible by members of the National Farmers Organization. In this area, we invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is a gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the true nation's prosperity level, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers. A brighter day for American agriculture. <laughs>